Hello everybody, and welcome back to the Ancient Mathems Project. I'm Arletson. And I'm Grant Thompson, just along for the ride. And today we are going to be going over the cards from the first two packs of the Dwarvedelf Cycle, the Redhorn Gate and Road to Rivendell. Uh, these uh, these packs, really this entire cycle, are well known for some cards that are just a little bit overpowered, and a lot of cards that just don't quite do enough. Um, I guess, you know, it's, it's very much a follow-up to the first cycle of the game where uh, we're still figuring out what the cost curve should be. That sound about right to you, Grant? Yeah, um, definitely. I mean, if you look further on in the cycle, you have things like Spirit Glorfindel, you have Elrond and Vilya, and it's all so powerful. But then you look in, you look at say, um, Bomba, um, and he's great for underground missions and what have you. But for everything outside of that. He's just a little bit meh. I'll hold off until I get a hero bomb back. <laughs> but he was one of the thirteen one of the thirteen that went to Erebor, so I've got some sort of respect for Bomba, but Ally version just quite doesn't quite cut it for me. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds good. So let's just go over these cards in order. We've uh, between the two packs, we've made modifications, large or small, to about ten of them. Well, there is ten here, man. <laughs> okay, fair enough. <laughs> it's been a long day. I can't math. So we'll start off with uh, the Dude and Wanderer. Okay, so the original card reads. Five cost for one willpower, two attack, two defense, two hit points. It has range, sentinel, and secrecy three. So, outside of a secrecy deck, this is very expensive. And yes, you're getting ranged and sentinel, but it is still a very, very expensive card if you're not playing a secrecy deck. And yes, leadership has a lot of resource acceleration, but five cost for that stat line, I think I'd go, I think I'd spend one extra and get Bayon or Brock Iron out. Brock Iron Fist out. <laughs> <laughs> I'd do it for the original version of Brock Iron Fist, not even our uh, <laughs> Yeah. Our boosted one. Yeah. <laughs> um Okay. Yeah, I feel so, about the same way on this one. Uh, even in a secrecy deck, though, I'd I'd even say he's a little bit lackluster. He's too cost for kind of a flexible stat line, but you really don't get all that much out of him. Um, if you're playing a multiplayer game, he may be able to help chip in and kill a hill troll, or he might be able to tank an attack from a marsh adder and just basically be one of those um, chump blockers. But for the cost of two... In a secrecy deck, that's not so bad, but for a five, yeah, no, black yeah. Stuff. Um, so the changes we've made, we've reduced his cost to um, four, so not such a big reduction, but we've given him secrecy two instead of secrecy three, so he's still got that two will um, two resource cost. He keeps his range and sentinel. But while you are engaged with an enemy, Dunedain Wanderer gains response. After Dunedain Wanderer readies, deal one point of damage from a character you control. Limit once per round. Now, I like this change. It gives um, healing in a sphere that doesn't generally generate healing. <laughs> and it makes them a lot more viable than when outside of the secrecy deck. Agreed. Um, you still, you probably want to play this card in a Dunedain deck. Yeah. 
Um, and even in a secrecy deck, I mean, in a secrecy deck, you're not normally trying to keep engaged enemies around, but if you are keeping engaged enemies around, that's uh, possibly one of the worst possible scenarios for a secrecy deck, and this guy is helping you in those bad scenarios, as well as contributing stats on the table. Well, even in some of the earlier quests where enemies had higher engagement costs, there were still so many that had um, low engagement costs, like the Dolgodua Orcs. And unless you are like literally at lower than 10 threat, an enemy is going to be engaging with you. And maybe you don't have enough attack power to kill, say, an enemy that you've got engaged. Um, and you're tanking it, and you're just able to do and it's just doing chip damage to you. It's a great way to heal off that chip damage. I think you are exactly right. We'll, uh, we'll be excited to see if we can get this guy onto the table. Yep. See if the, uh, the change lives up to the hype, but we're excited to give it a shot. Yes, let's... So what we've got next then, my friend? Uh, timely Aid. And the original Timely Aid is a brilliant card in a secrecy deck uh secrecy three and a cost of four means that you're only paying one cost for the action reveal the top five of your cards your deck put one revealed ally into play of able and shuffle all other revealed cards back in your deck um the problem with so many of the very early secrecy cards was that um while they often provided useful and sometimes really super powerful like this one effects in a secrecy deck they were completely unplayable outside of a secrecy deck um, and so our approach to many of these secrecy cards has been just to lower the cost slightly keep the secrecy value or adjust it in such a way so that you're still spending the same cost in secrecy but just to try to make these cards a little bit more playable. Yeah. Um, so that it, and it's now something you maybe consider outside of some just very narrow deck building yeah. constraints. Yeah, and I think with Timely Aid we've done that because searching the top five cards for an ally, and it doesn't matter what the ally is, it could be, say, Beyond. It could be a... Um, Raven Hill Scout, it could be any ally, it could be Yarzan, Jaber, or Furial. It doesn't matter because it's just an ally that you put into play from your deck. You then shuffle your deck. And for the cost of three resources outside of a secrecy deck, I can't see a downside to that. Sure. I mean, at three resources, I'm not putting it into every deck I make. No, not every deck, but. But I but, might at least consider it. Yeah, it's bumping up, bumping it up from a secrecy only card to well, you see, I could actually do it like that. <laughs> exactly. So what do we got next, Grant? We have taking initiative, the zero cost event from, um, that reads: discard the top card of your deck if the discarded card's printed cost is equal to or higher than the number of characters you control, draw two cards and deal two damage to an enemy. Now, I have to admit, I never really played with this card when I started playing the game. I just didn't have... Discarding the top card of my deck just didn't seem um, worth it. And generally speaking, if you're running a swarm deck, this card isn't going to really do you any good except for maybe the first turn. <laughs> sure. Um, I I have never seen a deck that reliably gets this card to pull itself off. Um and even the ones that try handicap themselves to the point that they're not really that very good decks, and they still can't make it work. So uh, it it was definitely a high priority candidate for our project. So what have we done to it, Grant? 
Well, we need it so you can only play it if you control two of your heroes. Uh, Pat can discard the top card of your deck to choose one. Draw two cards or add two resources um, to the resource pool of a hero you control. Then if you can control five characters or less, deal two damage to an enemy in play. So I think this is a lot more viable because it's not restricted to the cost of the card you discard and you're getting an immediate benefit so yes i may discard one but i'm getting to either draw two cards or get resources and then if i'm running say um the three hunters contract or um the gray wanderer i can then deal two damage that's even more better <laughs> <laughs> This card comes alive, I think, with the Grey Wanderer contract. Oh, for sure. This will be an auto-include in a Grey Wanderer deck. But even before, in a two-hero deck, it uh, it works very well with in a Strider deck. Yes. Which are all very, very far ahead in the card pool. But, you know, one of the things that uh, Secrecy was trying to do, even with the release of Spirit Glorfindel, right, is Secrecy was trying to... Uh, explore the two hero deck oh definitely because up until this point yeah you had it you could build a two hero deck to get a lower threat but other than engaging some strong enemies turn one or turn two there wasn't really a benefit so trying to so making secrecy and playing around with giving benefits to secrecy being like below 20 threat was like their way of saying well yeah if you run two heroes we'll give you an added bonus to the cost of this card <laughs> <laughs> exactly so next up what do we have keeping count now this is a fun little card a zero cost attachment uh limit one per hero and then um every time your hero attacks and destroys an enemy you put a resource token on it and your hero gets plus one attack for each resource token on this card that's above, or sorry, for each resource token on another copy of Keeping Count that's above the current number of resource tokens on this card. This is thematically beautiful. Two different heroes attacking away, trying to... One of each other. Exactly. Have a, have Legolas a and Gimli. <laughs> this, is, this is exactly it. The Legolas and Gimli compi orc killing competition card. Uh, the yeah. problem is, is that it's not a very good card. Um, because of the fact that you have to draw two of the three copies in your 50 card deck, uh, or 50, or more than 50 card decks if you're me and can't cut down to 50, <laughs> Cough. You uh, you can't rely on being able to rack up incredible attack values with keeping count. And even if you can reliably find multiple copies, you have to be able to kill enemies without it in order to be able to do stuff with it. Well, this card kind of puts me in mind of, say, having a mediocre attacker that or even let's say tactics here win i know it's far off in the future but um let's just use her as an example you put this on tactics here win which is attacking for one you've got a brilliant attack uh, let's say um grimby on the old and he's wiping out enemies left right and center because of his ability he's racking up resources on keeping count you find your second copy of keeping count and you put it on eowyn she then has say a plus five or a plus six on resources to kill her to um add to her attack so that puts her up to seven give or take if you're using six as an example you then activate her ability which then gives her a plus nine to her an attack that can kill off pretty much anything in the game, but even attacking for seven is nothing to be sniffing at. <laughs> That's fair. Um, still, it's not a great card because, as you said, 
you have to still find that second piece. And especially at this early point in the game, it's hard to find that kind of card draw. Yeah. So what have we done to um, make it better? <laughs> <laughs> well, we've... We haven't really adjusted the wording, although we've moved it around a little bit on the card. You can see that the card is a little bit packed. We've also added a limit to plus five attack, just because uh, part of our philosophy is that unlimited things have can run into really awkward issues Bro really quickly. Or can break the situation really, really badly. <laughs> yep. Um, but... The, uh, the most notable thing is we've added a response. After Keeping Count enters play, you may spend one resource to search your deck for another copy of Keeping Count and put it into play. Okay. So, it, it solves the card draw problem immediately and leaves you just sitting there trying to uh, solve the kill the enemy's problem in order to build up the stack of resources. Yeah. Um, so next up we have the Rider, Mark, the Rider of the Mark, which is a three cost, two willpower, one attack, one defense, two hit point, um, Rohan character, with the action spend one spirit resource to give control of Rider of the Mark to another player. Limit once per round. After Rider of the Mark changes control, discard a shadow card dealt to an enemy you are engaged with. Now, when this first came out, I liked this card. It was unique. You pass control of it to another player, you got to discard a shadow card from an enemy that you're engaged with. But, at the same time, both players, to get decent use out of it, had to be running spirit characters. Which... In the early game, you might have done um, just to gain extra resources for Gladrum's greeting, threat reduction, test of will, etc. But it was just like, yeah, I'm spending a resource every turn to get rid of a shadow card, but I'm actually going to drop that and I'm not going to go for a law hero and I'm going to go Burning Brand before the Aurora. <laughs> sure. <laughs> um... This is a, a tricky card. It's got a, an effect that can absolutely be clutch in certain situations. Um, especially when it's paired with some sort of a shadow card scrying, like uh, Dark Knowledge, or um, our new uh, version of Dawn Take You All. Silver Lamp is another one. Silver Lamp, yes. Um, the problem is, is that it's... Three cost for two willpower, and an ability that keeps draining your resources. Um, three cost for two willpower in spirit is already kind of a hard sell. Um, there's so many two cost two willpower things that if you're just going for efficiency, you go with something else. So if you're going to include the red of the mark, you're going to include it for its ability, but its ability is often tricky to actually get working okay so to to basically um get around that we've just changed it slightly and action spend one spirit resource to give control of rider of the mark to another player then discard a shadow card from an enemy engaged with that player and but we made it so that any player may trigger this action so and it's still limited once per round. So you can't just say, well, you know what? I've got four resources. We've got four players. Each of us going to get to discard a shadow card this round. <laughs> sure. Um, um, oh, go ahead. So this way, say the writer of the mark was engaged with me. And then I pass it over to you to get rid of your shadow card. But you don't have a spirit hero. But the next round, we've got an even nastier shadow card. And it's like, right, well, I'm going to spend that resource to bring them back so I can get rid of that shadow card. <laughs> because you can't, because you don't have a spirit hero. Absolutely. The other thing we've done is we've uh, moved that one point of defense into uh, attack well, power. Yes. 
which makes the moving around the board a little bit more useful. Uh, questers moving around the board is not a particularly useful thing to do, but this Rider of the Mark can also be a, a fair attacker, so it's given the Spirit Sphere kind of a, uh, a pseudo-ranged ability, if you will. Yeah, for one resource. So, yeah, I'm interested to play around with the Rider of the Mark in the upcoming games. Yeah, it's it'll be uh, interesting to see how it plays out. I think having access to a little bit more attack in spirit will be useful. Useful. <laughs> okay, what we got next? Renewed friendship is a card I have always wanted to like and then never actually liked. Um, it's a zero cost spirit event. After another player plays an attachment on a hero you control, you may choose one, either ready one of that player's heroes, have that player draw a card, or lower that player's threat by two. Really just kind of an underwhelming effect. I mean, sure, it's a zero-cost card, but it's also taking up a slot in your deck, and it's not giving you a lot of oomph for that slot in your deck. Added to that, it also kind of requires decks that are built not only to work with each other, but built to play attachments on each other, and that's just not a common way to deck build. I mean, I've used this card, I mean, when I first started playing the game, and this came out, um, me and me, me dad, who I used to play with, we built decks, and... Nine times out of ten, this went in uh, one of the decks because of the fact that we were always passing attachments around, whether or not we were doing it because one of we needed more action advantage or more attack power, and the other one had a way of giving it. it. It was always one way or another. So I've used this card, I'd say, a fair bit during my early time playing the game, but yeah, the effects were a little bit lackluster. But for zero cost and what we got at that point in time, it may have stopped work engaging a hill troll, or it may have allowed work to play, say, a steward of Gondor, or any any number of reasons, or drawing a, a feint. It was it was nice, but yes, the effects are a little lackluster. So, what did we do to improve upon this? Well, to uh, to help it compete with other options for the slot, uh, we basically just increased the value of the boosts. Um, in we can, you can now uh, choose to either ready one of that player's heroes, have that player draw two cards, or lower that player's threat by three. This brings it into line with uh, other zero-cost cards like Elrond's Council or uh, Darren's Runes. Whereas Darren's Runes requires you to discard a card, instead this one's cost is that another player has has to play an attachment on you first, and then it works on the other player, not on you. Okay, so I'm definitely looking forward to seeing this come out into play. <laughs> Absolutely. And so, I'm glad we kept that ready one of that player's heroes options. It's always very tricky, because this card can almost only ever get played in the uh, planning phase. Although with some guarded cards that's now slightly different. Uh, there's some options to get attachments attaching in uh, travel phase or other phases. But yep, um, So next up we have Bomba. The three cost, zero willpower, zero attack, one defense, three hit point dwarf. With exhaust action, exhaust bomber, choose a location. That location gets minus one threat until the end of the phase. That location does not contribute its threat. Instead, if it's an underground location, Ugh, bomber. You oh. could do so much more. <laughs> I mean, is this the worst ally in the game? I'd like to say no. Because we've already had that. <laughs> okay, fine, yes. Uh, but it's definitely an ally that probably won't see play unless it's in a dwarf deck. And even then, it's got to have, 
be in a quest that has a lot of underground locations to get any value out of his ability. His stat line, yeah, he can tank a hit for um, three or less, but an attack of four or greater, he's going to get crushed. <laughs> I mean, one defense, four hit points. In he's for me, he's overcosted for what he does. That three cost for that stat line and ability, it just doesn't work for me. He could probably be zero cost, and I still don't think I'd put him in the deck unless we were going <laughs> underground. <laughs> well, that's fair. I mean, it was the early signs of trying to get location control where you mitigate threat rather than placing progress. I really do think they overestimated how useful that ability would be. Yeah. <laughs> Definitely. Either that or they're trying to make a thematic statement by making him useless, but... That's just harsh. Well, bomba. <laughs> Sorry, maybe that was a little bit overboard. Anyways, what have we done to, uh, to kind of spruce him up a bit? Well, we've given him plus one willpower and plus one attack. Just to even out his um, cost. Um, and he changed his actions slightly. Um, so after he exhausts, um, you choose a location and that location gets minus two until the end of the phase. And if it's, a mount, um, if it's an underground location, it doesn't contribute its threat. So, Absolutely. So, so it's... It's a choice. You can either send them the quest for one or two, possibly, if you're running DNA in foot, or you can mitigate two threat from a location. Um, with his boosted defense, uh, it's gone from one to two. He's also oh, yeah. a, uh, a passable defender. Two yep. defense and three hit points isn't going to stop anything huge, but he's a dwarf, so that's not too hard to buff him up. Well, yeah, you've got, I mean, you've got hardy leadership that comes out in a little in a later pack, or is it already been out? I can't remember. It's it's coming, or it's been. It's a good card. It gives them a plus to hit points. Then you've got things like the armor of Erebor that's not long since come out, which goes on a dwarf character, not a hero. So that puts them up to th um, three, four. So that means seven attack to kill outright. So yeah, that makes it all the more plausible to become a defender. And as a lore character, he's eligible to, for the uh, Burning Brand. Yeah. There you go. Or even um, Dark Knowledge, or is Dark Knowledge limited to heroes? I can't remember. <laughs> I believe the Dark Knowledge is limited to heroes. Otherwise, he'd be an excellent candidate. Um, and... The nice thing I like is that you have a have the choice. You can uh, you don't have to send him to the quest. You can wait and see what comes up, and then if you decide you don't need him for defense, you can just cancel some threat. There you go. So I'm hoping that this change to Bomber makes him more efficient, but was time will tell. <laughs> Fair enough. Fair <laughs> enough. So what we got next, my friend? The Raven Hill Scout, a three cost ally with zero willpower, one attack, one defense, three hit points. <clears throat> the Dale and Scout traits in an action exhaust Raven Hill Scout to move up to two progress tokens from one, one, from one location to another location. Okay, and this card was definitely not one that I played. Again, that three cost for what he does, kind of lackluster. Yes, you get to move two progress tokens, so you could possibly clear out a location. But compared to something like sort of the Northern Tracker or the even the ever dreadful Lorien Guide, yeah. I would still pick up over the Raven Hill Scout because of the fact that they do something well. This is like with two progress tokens from one location to another location. But it's like, well, you've got to have those two progress tokens there to do it. <laughs> Absolutely. And it's like, well, 
the wording could have been slightly better to make it slightly better. If it had said move up to, well, it does say move up to two, um, but it could have been done, like, say, as a response to after he commits to the quest and giving him some willpower. Funny story, Grant. Uh, <laughs> that's exactly what we did. Is it now? I didn't know. <laughs> <laughs> so we've given him a, a little bit of willpower, two willpower, actually. It makes him a very respectable quester. Three costs for two willpower is kind of the, the standard in lore. And we've changed his ability to a response. After Ravenhill Scout commits to the quest, you move up to two progress tokens from one location to another quest location. So he's still um, going to be able to do just about anything you need him to. Well, oh. that's maybe a little overconfident. But he's still <laughs> going to be able to do your location control, but without uh, eating up a useless action. He's going to yeah. be contributing to the quest. He's going to be... Uh... In... With that three hit points, he's not going to be as susceptible to um, treacheries likes of um, Dark and Dreadful. Yep, or Necromancer's Reach, or uh, Evil yeah. Storm. Yeah, it's going to take a while to chip through that three hit points. And with all the deal attachments that have come out since... Um, the wilds of Ravanian and what have you. Um, this may get to see a lot more play. <laughs> <laughs> me being the key word. <laughs> me. I think he's a very good uh, companion to the Lorian guide, even at this point in the card pool. Yeah, I could say that. Move two progress from an active location to something on the staging area. Yeah, like, say, um, Gladden Fields. <laughs> Absolutely. And if you've got a Northern Tracker on the board, that clears out um, Gladden Fields a turn earlier, if you've got two progress already on um, the active location. Yep. Okay, so next up we have Needful to Know, the two-cost lore event with Secrecy 2. Action, raise your threat by one to look at the top card of the encounter. Then reduce your threat by X, where X is the threat of that card. This card is tricky. It's tricky, is it? <laughs> yeah. I mean, it's threat reduction and lore, which is always nice. But it's two cost for an inconsistent effect. Yeah. And one that requires you to raise your uh, your threat to even uh, get a chance to make it work. So it's basically secrecy two, doom one. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Essentially. Yes. Well, in solo at least. Yeah. At least it's not raising everybody else's threat. No, true. But. Essentially, <laughs> that's basically what it's doing. It's raising your threat, so it may be limited to you, but it's still technically doomed one. <laughs> sure. Um, so, I like the fact that it can reduce your threat, but again, it's that constant threat raise that I am not so sure is always viable. Yeah, it's a wonderful thematic touch, but one that really is working at cross-purposes for the deck it's trying to fit into. Exactly. So what have we done to adjust it? Well, we've put it down to one cost and secrecy one. Um, action, look at the top card of the encounter deck, then reduce your threat by X, where X is the threat of that card. So basically we've just blow up the cost and remove the threat increase. Uh, lowering the cost makes it more valuable for a secrecy deck that uh, is just getting out of secrecy. Um, being able to uh, to stay in secrecy for a round or two longer is a very valuable effect. 
Um, and that's really all I have to say about this card. Again, it's an example of one of those uh, overcosted outside of secrecy uh, cards that we saw a lot in the Dwardel cycle. Yep, so what we got next, my friend? Alright, I really do think this is the absolute worst card in the game. <laughs> it's worse than Brock. Maybe. <laughs> the I mean, I can see. Uh, I mean, I can see the uses for this, but the few and far between. Yes, well, I mean, so so are the uses for Brock, but Brock at least gives you willpower. <laughs> well, I can't argue with the willpower bit. <laughs> <laughs> so the end comes is a zero cost uh, neutral event. After a dwarf character leaves play, shuffle the encounter discard get pile back into the encounter deck. I mean, that's one that you kind of have to sit back, read two or three times, and then ask yourself, is this really a card? <laughs> is this really a card? <laughs> Apparently it is. Now, okay, in fairness to this card, since it was released... Uh, there have been released a number of other quests where every now and again, maybe it could be useful to shuffle the encounter deck into the discard pile back into the encounter deck. Uh, the Angmar Awaken Cycle is a good example with the uh, Cursed Dead. If you got four of those in the discard pile, it's probably a very good idea to just shuffle it back in so that the last one doesn't randomly show up and ruin your day. I was actually thinking something a little bit closer to home, actually. Okay. Um, the Hills of Emin Wheel. When you've got to get those um, nasty um, victory point locations in the victory display, if you've got, say, you're just needing one or two extra victory point cards and you've got a couple in the discard maybe this is a way to get them out quicker or sure. even red horn gate where you've got to get those victory points and there's only a couple of them in the deck <laughs> that's also true um it could potentially be useful in quests with objectives where the objectives have gone into the discard pile uh the dead marshes with golem is one um even perhaps escape from Dol Guldur if you've lost some of the uh, the guarded objectives. Yep. Uh, even in those cases, though, I'm still not sure this is worth a spot in your deck. There's a possibility. Um, I'm just saying there could be uses for it. Sure. Anyways, uh, let's uh, stop talking about how bad it is and start talking about what we've done to fix it. Okay, so what we've done to fix it, my friend? Well, uh, we kept its action, shuffled the encounter deck's card file into the encounter deck, uh, made it not have to trigger off of a dwarf leaving play, because that's just too restrictive. Um, but we've given it a response. After the end comes is discarded from the top of your deck, each player draws two cards and adds a resource to each of their hero's resource pools. Then each player discards the top five cards of the encounter deck and puts the topmost enemy in the discard pile into play engaged with them. Okay. So this card is now an extremely powerful, a risky card, but an extremely powerful card in a dwarf mining deck. Okay. Um, or, you know, any other deck that involves discarding cards off the top of the deck. So what do you think about it, Grant? I think it's going to be interesting to play. <laughs> um, definitely could be useful um, but it could also be very lackluster only time will tell <laughs> sure 
we will uh, we will play it as the dwarf mining deck begins to develop, and we will see how it turns out. Definitely. All right. Well, thank you for sticking with us as we've gone through the ten player cards of these two packs that we've adjusted. Uh, hope you join us next time as we discuss the player cards from Watcher in the Water and the Long Dark. And keep an eye out for the Ancient Mathems Progression series videos, which will accompany this one, where we'll take decks that include at least a number of these cards and run them up against uh, the quests that came out in these packs. And until then, happy questing. <laughs>